Today, I'm gonna to be birding in Willow Point and Campbell River. I'm gonna bird along the shoreline, kind of what I had in plan for yesterday before a snow squall hit. So basically, I'm gonna be birding the shore, looking in the ocean, and maybe checking some of the shoreline vegetation as well. There's kind of a frontal system over me. I'm hoping that clears up a bit. The coastal mountains are clear and look incredible this morning. One thing you always have to consider when birding at the ocean is tide. I like birding at low tide. The reason why I like birding at low tide is it exposes habitats that birds can forage in and it seems like more birds kind of hang around the shore. So hopefully we can still see some stuff given that it is a higher tide. Now I'm not sure what my chances of getting a year bird are today. I have done quite a bit of birding down here, but I would like to video some harlequin ducks and black scoters, which are both incredible species and would make for some good footage. So let's go birding and I hope you enjoy the video. Starting out, I headed north up the beach. Before long, I spotted a group of a dozen or so black scoters. What's a scoter? They are sea ducks. There are three species of scoter that occur regularly in North America, the others being surf and white-winged scoter. All three are seen off the coast of British Columbia in the winter. The male black scoter can be distinguished from other scoter species by its yellow bill knob and lack of white anywhere on its body. These knobs are referred to as basal knobs and are found in other anatids, meaning ducks, swans, and geese. Their purpose are not well understood, but they might be an indicator of health or maturity. What I do know is the contrasting black and yellow of this duck makes for a striking appearance. They're a true GLD, a good looking duck. Females are brownish with a pale area on their cheek and a dark cap. On their wintering grounds, scoters feed by diving for crustaceans and mollusks. It's characteristic for black scoter to form these flocks in the winter. Not having much experience with this species, I could watch these guys for hours. But I decided to keep going to see what other birds I might find. After trudging up the rocky shore, I saw some of my second target species, Harlequin duck. They were pretty far off the shore, meaning I had to crop these shots a bit. Harlequins are gorgeous. In Alberta, they were a rare treat. Here in BC, you can see dozens of them on an hour walk along the shore. Despite their relative abundance here, their beauty is still amazing. Their name is in reference to the stupendous clown-like plumage of the males. Later on, I was gazing at the coastal mountains, when in the corner of my eye, I saw it the dread of the Discovery Passage. The pirate ship, the Pelagic Cormorant's revenge. Arr! Four Pelagic Cormorants cruising on this log. They seemed to be increasing alarmed as it drifted to shore. Pelagic Cormorants are quite a bit smaller than the species I'm used to, the double-crested Cormorant. Now the beauty of a Cormorant might be a tough sell to suck, but if you look closely, you might be able to see their iridescent plumage shimmering blue and green. A year-round resident, these birds hunt around kelp beds and rocks. They feed on small, bottom-living, non-schooling fish, such as rockfish or sculpins. Cormorants have a vestigial or undeveloped oil or preen gland, so their plumage is not waterproof. As a result, they need to dry their feathers after a dive, which is why they might be on this log. Why is a bird that spends so much time in water not waterproof? Oil is buoyant, so having less on their feathers mean they can dive deeper for sashimi. It's a classic trade-off. With a shore collision imminent, it was time to abandon ship. Birds weren't the only animals in the surf that day. This harbor seal was curious to check me out. It watched me intently as I watched it. These Labrador retrievers of the sea are a common sight along the coast here. Several times, it would appear, bob up and down in the waves, before submerging again, and then repeating the process. Headed back, I saw this black-bellied plover on the shore. It took me a while before I saw it was surrounded by a group of black turnstones. It seemed like it was keeping watch while the turnstones slept and preened. Not all the turnstones were up for rest and relaxation. These two had a bit of a scrap. Lover's quarrel, turf war, who knows. Further on my walk back, I saw a red-tailed hawk above, a new species on the ear. I was not the only one to notice it. 
as a group of crows were harassing it in flight. This behavior is called mobbing. Crows do it a lot. It happens when smaller prey species cooperatively attack or harass a larger predator. This behavior not only drives the predator away, but it also lets others know the predator is around. There is also evidence it plays a role in new generations learning how to identify predators. The hawk tried to hide from the assault in a large fir tree, but that did not deter the crows. Before long, the hawk decided to take flight again and the crows were in hot pursuit. Yes, they're more nimble flyers, but you have to give the crows credit for their bravery confronting a hawk with razor sharp talons and beak. So guys, I got towards the end of my walk. It hasn't been a super birdie. There has been a few species here and there. Seeing that interaction between the red-tailed hawk and the crows was really interesting. And I also saw the black scoters and harlequin ducks, which I sought out to see. So gotta be happy with that. I don't know if the low activity is because of the tide or it's a little choppy out there, but maybe on a calmer day, I'll try this walk again and see what we can see.